morning, good morning. Oh, 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 my neck, my neck's been killing me. Oh, I don't know. I don't know why I do these videos because they take up a massive amount of Google Drive. Not that they cost much, but and I haven't posted, I haven't uploaded any for about four months, so or longer. We must be getting to the point now where uh, if you look at the early ones you can see that I, I look younger. But uh, anyway, how are you? How are you? Alright, I hope you're doing well. You look well. I'm, uh, I'm fine. I had a, I've got a, I'm working, a, a, my work pattern at the moment is Monday uh, Wednesday and Friday morning and this is the Friday morning and uh, Tuesday I tried to come in and do some paperwork but I ended up seeing four emergencies so and I can't resist an emergency even if it's a child who's got 60 cake teeth which is what it was and uh, we don't make any charge for that it's all done pro bono this is the this is the thing. It's um, good health information is is done on a pool basis. You know, you're. I'm never really interested about my uh, statistics about my liver on a day-to-day -day basis. But if the doctors do a test, then I do. I would like to read it. You know, I'm not interested enough to commission one. But I'll read one when when they've done one. Especially if they tell me that the figures aren't, you know, are out of uh, variables. Anyway, I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm talking about something much more serious. That is the Dental Law Partnership. Now, most dentists' view of the Dental Law Partnership is a plague on its house because it was set up by a bunch of people, I won't call them dentists, although they have dental qualifications and but they also have legal qualifications. So now it's not that I'm not calling them dentists out of disrespect, I was just trying to think of a way to describe someone who's obviously got, who's doubly qualified or qualified in two disciplines and therefore dentistry is not their main source of income, that's what, that's what I'm trying to imply. So. They decided that uh, they would combine their two skills in the only way possible, which is um, taking legal action against uh, dentists. So, I think they felt that the patients were somewhat disadvantaged in that, because most of dentistry is not, is, is pretty intangible, that when the patient got a raw deal, you needed to go and see a lawyer who was dentally qualified because only they could really tell you where you've been abused. So, anyway, they quickly earned the hate and disapprobium of uh, the entire profession for, for making a bad situation worse, which is what I think most dentists see as a, as a pretty unequal playing field, which I'll come to later. Uh, but they contributed to it by taking a large number of uh, actions against dentists uh, are probably you can make your own mind up whether they were justified or not justified uh, you may have had some contact with them yourself but the point was that they used to work on a contingency fee basis which means that which is also known as a no win no fee basis um, and it may be a bit more complicated than that I think that they they may, uh, there, there's insurance policies involved nowadays uh, that insure them or you against loss. And, um, you know, and they quickly uh, started racking up a series of uh, awards. Now, dentists are protected in so far as, uh, at, the, at the time, it wasn't a requirement to have indemnity insurance, but very quickly, um, mainly due to the influx of dentists from non-UK qualified dentists, uh, 
that uh, didn't you know have um, indemnity in when uh, had fixed term contracts or when one challenged on their clinical quality uh, tended to return home so the general dental council said look you know to work in the uk you must have indemnity so now everyone has to have indemnity and there's no um, copay on this indemnity so if it pays out then it's not like you have to pay the first thousand pounds of the claim or anything you you pay nothing uh, all that the uh, your indemnity uh, all that your your indemnifier asks is that you um, cooperate with them you know um, return their emails send letters that they will write on your behalf to your patient and um, all in all uh, what you know it's a pretty sweet deal except that the way that they they do um, uh, you know the co way the copay comes in is sort of in the form of a no claims discount insofar as if you if you have a claim then it'll go on your claims record and it's then taken into account in subsequent years in, in terms of set, setting your premium now we also have to put this against the background of um, no claims ever being taken to court so let's say that the patient uh, is upset they go to dental law partnership dental law partnership writes to your indemnifier um, claiming I don't know whatever £10,000 say for alleged negligence and uh, your indemnifiers will look at this uh, from a from with a with a lawyer's eye with a, a pragmatic eye with an eye to uh, how do we pay keep this claim down to the minimum possible now your uh, worry as a dentist is of course that uh, they're going to keep the claim down by throwing you under the bus <laughs> uh, I suppose it wouldn't do any good for their um, reputation if they got a built up a reputation for being useless at defending dentists so uh, that actually for the most part doesn't happen um, but although as a dentist you do feel that it uh, has happened because your recollection of what happened and their narrative almost always um, disagree you know so they uh, they make you feel like an unreliable witness to your own life <laughs> which is uh, it's a strange feeling and um, I was recently called as a witness to fact uh, at a GDC hearing uh, where uh, an ex-associate of mine had uh, done some implants on two patients and the cases were held, held, held together which I don't, don't agree with because I think then what happens is that the uh, faults which are assumed in one case are also assumed uh, in relation to the other case without being proved but that's another story um, so um, it was during Covid and so I asked if um, they, they asked if I wanted to sort of zoom in and uh, I said yes because you know who wants to struggle in to Wimpole Street and sit in some airless um, witness room for two hours while they uh, fanny about so I said yes and so of course I did a video uh, conference now what that meant was that I could do it out of the practice computer and I had I had the patients records notes x-rays and financial transactions right in front of me I mean literally I was sitting at the practice that the patient was treated at got her notes in, up in front of me on the computer and they started asking me questions and they were they were like, um, one of the questions was like, when did the patient pay the money for this treatment? So I told them and they said, now are you sure? Because, you know, we've had evidence from uh, Mr. So-and-so that um, it was like uh, a week later than that, or it was a, it was a week before that. And uh, and I'm like, well, I can have a look. No, let me have a look. Yes, no, that is right. Because I got the patient's receipt up in front of me. 
I've got their whole, you know, the day, the day the payment was made onto our financial system, and I've got the email uh, uh, acknowledging their payment and everything, and um, and um, <clears throat> so what? Uh, despite that, despite that, uh, my uh, when when I was referred to in the conclusion in the, in the summary of the GDC. It was said that I was an unreliable witness, and and I was unreliable in so far as uh, my evidence disagreed with that of the um, defendant. Right. I mean, despite the fact that the defendant was obviously conflicted in so far as he needed to put forward the, his best, his own best case. Whereas I was not conflicted in that there were no allegations made against me and all I had to do was put forward what I believed to be the truth. And, 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 you know, and had been present while this treatment had been carried out in the surgery and was therefore quite knowledgeable about what happened, you know, and <laughs> where the blame lie, where the, where the bodies were buried. I knew. <laughs> if they just said to me, Oh, Mr. Watson, well, you were present, you know, during the time that this dream was coming. What's your take on it? You know, what's it, what do you think? And I'm like, I could have told them, but they didn't ask me that question. It's a bit like, uh, because, because it's the English judicial system where uh, they like to give like the, the thumbs up or the thumbs down based on the evidence they presented to them by the, def- the defence and, um, and the prosecution. And no other evidence is uh, considered, and they don't have an inquisitorial system like they do in uh, Russia and France, where there's a prosecuting magistrate whose job it is, or Netherlands, or Van der Valk, where, where there's a, a prosecuting magistrate whose job is to uh, go out and, uh, and talk to people and make inquiries and find out what happened. And the reason why that Napoleonic code exists is that um, it's quite easy to beat prisoners into giving confessions. And so just merely uh, having a prosecution who stands up and said uh, X did Y and has confessed um, is not sufficient. It's not sufficient in Russia because... uh, of their history of uh, beating confessions out of people. So, so you can't just show that someone confessed. You have to, have, you have to actually investigate the thing and uh, see what happened, put some effort into trying to work out what happened. But, but the GDC doesn't do that because we don't have Napoleonic Code in the UK. We have the adversarial uh, system whereby two people... Um, put their best narrative and uh, and the judges sort of decide between them who's lying and who's telling the truth <laughs> so you know without without some quite pertinent information I, I might say anyway so <clears throat> so dental law I mean I'm working around to sort of saying that I've had a letter from dental law uh, quite recently and it's the first one I've had in what, 40 years of 40 years 40 plus years of doing dentistry if you include the time as a dental student and uh, and so I'd be interested to tell you about it because um, it may be useful for you but I'll, I don't have enough time to do that in this podcast but I'm just sort of setting the background to it The about was this lawyer's eye, you know, this lawyer's eye on, this, on, on, on the facts. And what they'll do is they'll, they'll say, if we go to court on this, 
there's, let's say they're claiming £20,000, there's a 50% chance we'll lose, 50% chance we'll win. So let's put a, a value on our loss of 10,000. On average, 100 cases like this, we're, we're, we're gonna lose 10,000 pound on average. Now, in order to prepare for a case like this, uh, we might have to spend 12,000 pounds or 15,000 pounds on average. So on average, in a case like this, it's probably best if we don't go to court because we're going to lose money most of the time. So they will then write to the uh, the uh, dental law partnership and say, "Look, you know, are you ha are you willing to walk away with um, five thousand pounds in full and final settlement?" Uh, on the basis of no admission of guilt. And uh, Dental Law Partnership then has to make the same, do the same sum on the other side. You know, what are the chances of us winning this? How much will we win? How much will we, uh, we earn? Um, and the rules on what they can earn have changed. I mean, they changed quite significantly. They were becoming, they were becoming a real nuisance. Um, because they were earning uh, large amounts. And um, a cynic, not me, but a cynic might say that uh, the sum or the majority of the cases that they bought were bought uh, on, because it made them um, wealthy, you know, brought them in money made them successful. I'm not, nothing against success. They were good at what they did. That's all I'm going to say. The, uh, the guys who set it up, as far as I know, went to the Olympics. I'm a dentist. I couldn't afford to go to the Olympics. But then, um, perhaps they were keen sports people. In fact, I'm sure they were. So this is where I, this is what I'm saying that none of so none of this comes to court. What they do is they agree a figure which is less than um, what the patient's asking for, but everybody gets a, a, a taste, as they used to say in the Soprano. Everybody gets a taste. There's no uh, admission. And the uh, everyone comes away happy, except the dentist, whose premium may go up, and also you know, and and comes away with a sense of injustice because they feel that uh, they've been <laughs> like they've had had one of their fingers cut off for being five minutes late for school, and you have to get past that. It's, I used to deal with these cases when I was uh, working for the diffusion organisation dentist used to say, you know, what, how shall I reply? And I said, well, I don't, you know, you've got to say X, X and X. Oh, can you write the letter? No, I can't write the letter. You're, you all have to do that. Okay. So they'd write a letter and it'd be like three pages long. And I'd say, right, okay. The only problem is it's three pages too long. You've just got to write back and you say, you, you know, you regret that, uh, that the patient is unhappy. You don't have to say that you regret what you did, but it's quite okay to write back and say you, you regret that the uh, patient had cause to complain, or, or had reason, you know, or felt that they had cause to complain. You know, the wording is quite critical, and that um, and we used to cut, we used to blue pencil 90% uh, of this stuff, uh, and, and it was written in the most shocking English as well. I mean, some people don't even use full stops, so. What your first instinct is to write this massive, massive, massive long letter back saying that you think the patient is a psychopath and a narcissist. 
and really that's not the best thing to do. The best thing to do is to look at your most recent satisfaction survey and realise that you're getting the sort of 97.6 satisfaction rate and uh, say, tell yourself that you, what a good dentist you are. You know, how patients can get a, a, an answer if they ring and they don't have to wait three days. Our patients can get emergency appointments for pain at short notice at your practice. Um, I'm not saying that you should sort of um, bask in the fact that some of your patients love you because, uh, you know, some patients love every dentist. You could be the worst dentist in the world and still have patients who love you. But, don't, uh, uh, <clears throat> don't sort of, don't sort of let it get to you. And I've had, I've heard uh, indemnity societies say this in talks and video podcasts. Don't, you mustn't take it personally. Where it's very difficult not to take it personally. You know, if someone makes an, uh, an allegation after 40 years that you're a, de- you're a dentist, a negligent dentist, and they have to allege negligence, that's, in a way, that's good because you mustn't, merely have done something wrong or something has gone wrong or something that they wanted to succeed hasn't succeeded they have to prove that you you knew what you were doing that you knew how to do it right and you carelessly and recklessly just did what the hell (laughs) without any care at all you know without that you were reckless and that as a result you were you didn't exercise your skill when you could have done and you should have done and that you were just negligent in your care uh, negligent obviously being neglected so and that's quite a high bar you know when patients make complaints you have to think to yourself that they don't they, they, they don't just have to prove that the filling fell out two days after you did it they have to prove that in doing the filling you were you had a total disregard for the principles of dentistry and fillings and whether or not it would fall out. <laughs> you just didn't care, you know. Uh, but when it's alleged, it's uh, it's very painful. I mean, it hurts, it really does. And what you have to do is you just have to almost do nothing for a couple of days until that emotion, till you get over that emotion, you know. And, uh, and this is what I've done increasingly as I've gone got to be a more senior dentist. You know, people ring up and say, oh, you know, I don't, you've done a root filling and I've got a bit of post operative pain. And, and, and I say to them, look, you know, your root filling is, I was thinking of putting your root filling in for the national root filling competition. It is so good. You know, it's so brilliant. It is, I am so good. You don't have anything to worry about. And then what they do, and I mean, obviously this only works if you are good. Oh, that's my patient, he's five minutes early. Two minutes. There you go. Anyway, I'll tell you about the case next time. It's an interesting case, I'll let you know, and let you know how it goes. It hasn't finished yet, I'm still in the middle of it. All right, see you soon. Bye.